Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning in to this worship service, and I uh, hope that uh, God speaks to us through it in our time together. I want us to look at a scripture passage from Romans in chapter 7, and it begins this way. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that's living in me that does it. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Let us pray. Wonderful, gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, and for the opportunity to spend some time together here today uh, on this and looking how it applies to our lives and uh, to our community of faith. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, again, uh, welcome. Uh, this service, this or this sermon, uh, the, uh, is actually the continuation of the uh, service from last week. Last week, um, uh, we started in the sixth chapter of Romans, and so we're picking up chapter seven and uh, calling this the intersection of freedom and responsibility, and this is part two. So last week, we were playing with the idea that Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, especially chapters 1 through 8, uh, had been heavily influenced by the story of the prodigal son. Even much of Paul's entire work, I believe, is influenced by the story of the prodigal son. And we discovered that much of the struggle 
uh, that Paul is dealing with is our human struggle as well because these two personality types, the older son and the younger son that we find in the story of the prodigal son are universal. Uh, and we have to find a way to get along with one another. Uh, the goal of the, that the Bible sets is not that they would just blend into one personality type, uh, but the Bible celebrates the diversity that we have. And so we talked about how Paul would have been very familiar with this prodigal son story as, it, as Jesus' words circulated in the early church. The story of the prodigal son would have probably been at the top of the list of uh, most familiar stories of Jesus. If somebody asked uh, a person, what's one of the things that Jesus said, uh, can you tell me? They'd probably talk about the prodigal son. I also believe that it, it commands a lot of Paul's attention because Paul lived in both worlds. He had a uh, first half of life experience that matches the older brother, and then a second half of life experience that mirrors the younger brother. And so that's kind of what I want us to, to look at a little bit uh, today. In fact, when Paul talks about his early life uh, in Acts, uh, as he's telling his story in various places, you, you get the strong sense that he was a young older brother on steroids. Listen to what he says. In Acts chapter 23, verse 6, he says, I was the, a Pharisee, and I was the son of a Pharisee. So there is a, a lot of uh, legalism all wrapped up. Uh, in chapter 9, uh, uh, the early church is talking about Paul and how he acted. Uh, this was before his conversion. And it says that uh, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 of Acts, Paul was breathing out murderous threats against the followers of Jesus. He went to the high priest and asked the high priest for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found people who were following the way, or the Christian faith, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And then later on in Acts 22, verse 3 and 5, when Paul is on trial, he's speaking to the uh, Jewish leaders of the time, and he says, I'm a Jew. I studied as a Jew, thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors, as I, as I was just as zealous for God as any of you here today. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. So you see that from Paul's testimony of his early experience that he was a lot like the older brother. He was following the raw. He was following the rules. Uh, he, was, he valued what the older son valued that we talked about last week. Trust, loyalty, integrity, hard work, fair play. And that was Paul's life. He, he was consumed by that until on the road to Damascus, he had an experience with the risen Christ. And at that point, his, uh, he, he changed. He was different. And he saw God in a different way. And he saw a path to God in a different way. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39, he says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? And see what he does there? He turns that phrase because that's exactly what Paul did in his former, uh, in, in the first half of his life. He was the prosecutor. He was the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the one who went out and found uh, information out about folks who were uh, in this Christian organization. And so he says, uh, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? 
It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Well, see, that's what Paul was all about before he was condemning. So he says, no, no one, Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. So Paul's talking about his transformation and what he experienced, that even what he did against Christ, God is not condemning him. And he's beginning to articulate how amazing this is. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, Romans chapter 8 continues, shall trouble or hardship or persecution, again what Paul was involved with, or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul says in verse 37, no, in all things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, uh, neither the present or future or any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul has made this transformation from uh, the law and legal and doing all the right things, fulfilling all the right tasks as the way to salvation to an understanding here that it's not about our work, it's about God's grace and love. And, and he's amazed by that. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 12 to 14, he continues with that vein of thought. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So Paul has had this radical transformation and he sees God in a different way. Uh, and that's critical because God is using Paul in a magnificent way to speak and to teach uh, not only his generation, but you and me as well, uh, about who God is. And as we've talked about already, I think these uh, uh, characteristics and, and uh, characters, the older son and the younger son, uh, are, are, are you and I. Uh, it's how we see the world. It's what we value. It's how we look at the world. And so God's not trying to make us anything different, but he's trying to show us how, if we're the older son or the younger son, uh, how we move forward. And so Paul is able to speak to that because he's lived in both worlds. He has experience in the feelings and what's going on and the, what motivates you and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and so as we said last week, uh, Romans kind of outlines that. Uh, in, the, in the first couple of chapters, Paul explains how the Gentiles are just like the prodigal son. Not only uh, does Paul have both characteristics, he's now pointing out how in society and in the church around us, we, we see those same characteristics as well. And he says the prodigal son was awful, terrible, no good, very bad. But then in the uh, second and third chapter of Romans, Paul flips the script and he says to the Jewish Christians who are like the older brother, they're keeping the law, they're doing all the right things, they really haven't gotten into a lot of trouble. He says, uh, you are no better off. You go through the motion, you keep the rules, uh, but it's a faith that's in your head and not in your heart. So again, Paul has not only observed this, but he's lived it. And then he drops this bomb in the middle of the room in chapter 3, verse 10. No one is righteous, not even one. And so that's the stage that we're uh, walking on. That's the backdrop that we're looking at this from. The Gentiles are the prodigal. The Jews are the older brother. Uh, it, the... 
The comparison and the imagery wouldn't have been lost on Paul, uh, and I think he's using it as an intentional literary device, even though he's not naming that story. And it's the same thing with you and I, as, as uh, those of you that are listening today, um, maybe you're more like the older brother or maybe the younger brother. Uh, but you certainly know people, if you're the younger brother, that are like the older brother, and if you're the older brother, like the younger brother, and they get under your skin. Um, Paul wants to have a conversation with both of us because, again, God didn't make a mistake. All through the Bible, we see these uh, polarizing characters, uh, and they're put in the same room, in the same context with each other, and the, the, uh, the hope uh, and the design is that we find a way to work it out. The older brother values... Uh, Trust and loyalty, integrity, hard work, and fair play. And then the younger brother comes along and values spontaneity, exploration, taking risks and chances, uh, going where no one has ever gone before, uh, ready for adventure. Um, the, the younger brother values that spontaneity. And so in Romans chapter 7, uh, as we read just a few minutes ago, Paul is uh, talking again about his experience. You can see the, his lament uh, in these words. I didn't want to do anything wrong. I didn't set out uh, to uh, do something that hurt God. Uh, my intention was not to hurt people. Uh, I, my intention was to make my family proud. But sometimes I get out over my skis, I do the wrong thing, I act before I think. And so what is it that keeps me messing up? What is it that keeps me doing these things that I wish I didn't do? And, and how do I deal with the shame and the frustration and the sense of failure that comes as a result of that? I'm not my older brother. I will never be my older brother but I can't seem to find ways to change who I am. And so I think it's at that point that, that uh, Paul is talking to both the older brother and the younger brother to say, God's intent is not that you change who you are, uh, your personality, your characteristics. God has created you the way that you are, and that's something to be celebrated. But Paul uh, in this story of the prodigal son, and as he lived it, and as he talks about uh, here in the scriptures that, that we've uh, read, he's amazed that God has reached out to him. Uh, how did he say it in Timothy? The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Uh, do you hear Paul's surprise by that? Uh, it's, it's very much like the song Amazing Grace written by John Newton, uh, who was a former slave trader uh, who uh, indirectly or directly caused the death of hundreds of slaves being transported from Africa to uh, England. And as uh, in later years, as Newton realizes what he did and, uh, and uh, but uh, experiences the grace of God, he also can't uh, understand it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He, he owns his wretchedness uh, and, and has a hard time understanding uh, how God can be that gracious. Uh, and so that's part of the story that, that we're, we've been looking at with the prodigal son. Uh, the prodigal son returns from, home, uh, from a faraway land, wasted everything. Uh, he, he comes with his tail between his legs, uh, confessing to the father, I've sinned before God and before you. I'm not worthy even uh, to eat at your table. Uh, and the father lavishly celebrates the return of the younger son with so much love and grace and forgiveness that the younger son can't believe it. And as angry as the older son is that the father would, would celebrate the return of this wayward son uh, as over-the-top 
as that was for the older son, the younger son is also flabbergasted by what's taken place. And so in moving forward, uh, Paul is trying to hold up uh, these two uh, images for us. The characteristics, the personality, the type of person that the older son is, uh, and, uh, and, and make a justification for who they are and what they do, uh, but also the younger son, and hold both of these models uh, in tension. Uh, and that's important for Paul because uh, as we continue after Romans, uh, Paul, first and second Corinthians, uh, just talk about story after story of the fighting and the complaining and the bickering and the backfighting and the uh, just destruction of the church over what I think Paul would call petty issues. Uh, and all of the issues are about somebody who says, no, we ought to do it this way. And somebody else who says, yeah, but I'd rather do it this way. And there's a fight and there's a battle and it, they're in danger of destroying the church. Uh, and, and so Paul is uh, using this uh, imagery uh, in the back of his head as a way of talking about how, how can we value tradition and the way we've always done things, but also allow a place for people who are more creative and spontaneous uh, to find a way to work together. And so as Paul deals with ways of addressing the issues in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, he comes to Ephesians and Philippians and talks about grace and about unity and about love and about uh, finding a way to uh, work together. And this is vital. This is vital for the church and for you and I today. It's vital for our society, for our families, for our churches, for ourselves uh, to understand the differences between us and not just stand back and say, okay, for everything to be right, you have to change and see the world as I do. Uh, Paul never s says that, and we can go through the whole Bible as we did a little bit last week and look at the different people that God puts together who are different in just about every way. But the design is that they're supposed to work together and find a way to overcome their differences. So, as we sort of wind down today, how can the older son celebrate the younger son, but still hold on to trust, loyalty, integrity, hard work, fair play? And how can the younger son love the older brother, but still be carefree and spontaneous, fly by the seat of his pants, uh, and innovate? Well, one of the, the ways that that happens is in the actions of the younger brother. Uh, the younger brother, far away from home, comes to his senses, the Scripture says, and, and heads back to ask for forgiveness of the Father. And so I think that it, it starts there with the older brother and the younger brother recognizing that their way may not always be the best way or only way. And so again, I think it, it's in the back of Paul's mind as he addresses the church, because I think he has a, a specific word for the older brother and a specific word for the younger brother. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, Paul says, For it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. Uh, and, and we see there that, that Paul uh, is, is speaking from experience. I, I can't save myself by adhering to the law because the law, is, as Ephesians 2, 8 goes on, is a gift of God and it's not by works. It's not a reward for what I've done so that no one can boast. And that's the danger of the older son, to be aloof, better than everybody else, and to lord that over everybody in a boastful way. 
So Paul talks about the humility that's needed from the older brother that he, the older brother continues to uh, lift up and live by the values of trust and loyal integrity, hard work and fair play, but with a humility uh, and an understanding that it's not the end of all. And then to the younger brother, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do, God did by sending his own son. You know, the, the younger brother's not interested in the law. The younger son is looking for loopholes. No one has to tell the younger son that he messed up. He does a good enough job of that himself. He's his own worst critic. He struggles with shame, self-loathing, regret, feeling like he's a failure and he's let those he loved down. The law often just reminds him of how bad he messed up. But Paul is saying to the younger brother, but God's grace trumps all of that. And while failure may be something that you did, an act, it doesn't define who you are. If we could learn to see ourselves in the light of the grace of God, and if we could see others also truly created by God and living in the grace of God, Maybe some of the differences that we have wouldn't seem as important as sometimes they seem to be. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, for your life, for your help. We ask you to give us grace and guidance as we seek to not only live fully in the ways that you've created us, but to recognize the, the wonderful landscape and tapestry uh, that is the human race. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.